Hello, my name is Sarah Fetterman. I'm a recent graduate of the School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution at George Mason University. And today I'm going to take you through a little demonstration of my doctoral research. Rather than do the whole defense for uh, to put on the internet, we really wanted to share a snippet of, of the research. My research is on corporate accountability for mass atrocity, and I'm doing a study of the French National Railroad. The name of my dissertation is Allez Samp. Allez Samp means one-way ticket in French. Now, I'm going to give you a little sense of the structure of how I did my dissertation defense, and I'll do part of it with you today. I first look at why study the aftermath of atrocity and the role of market actors, the conflict that I actually addressed, which was the French National Railroad, my research approach, findings, and conclusion. First, I wanted to start with why study the aftermath. In conflict resolution, there's obviously so much emphasis put on prevention and understanding what actually happens during conflict. So it's surprising to people sometimes that one would spend so much time studying the aftermath. This picture shows kind of why the aftermath is so important, that the past really does live in the present in many ways. People, for one, are still living with the trauma, those who experienced it. A lot of the discourse is still in the culture. This was, is very much true in the conflict that I studied, and it's impacting the second and third generations in ways that they are not even present to. And it also really impacts foreign policy and the way in which people solve conflict today. Transitional justice is the study of this post-conflict, of the aftermath. And it looks, at, it looks at the aftermath through the lens of trials, so actual criminal trials against perpetrators, as well as truth commissions, commemoration, apologies, and restitution. And I go through those with the, with the French National Railroad conflict as well. And this field actually began with the Nuremberg trials, or the modern version of it did, which is very appropriate for my study, which is one that draws on the aftermath of World War II, the Holocaust. Now, the field has expanded since the Nuremberg trials, which was the first trial to try individuals for international war crimes. But now the field, even though it does a much broader human rights agenda and focuses on to move towards democracy, rebuilding institutions, victim services, and so on, it still largely occludes market actors. And that's something that I really want to bring back into the conversation. We talk a lot about rogue states. We talk a lot about states falling apart from within, individual perpetrators. And we'll talk about money. And we'll talk, about, we'll talk mostly about how money moves among these groups, not large, especially multinational corporations and domestic corporations that have a big influence on what's happening in these in these conflict zones. Now, the Holocaust, you may, know, may or may not know, had a lot of corporations involved. Some of the names that people are familiar with are Ford, IBM, Volkswagen, but there were many, many others that made the Nazi agenda actually material. To kill six million people in a, in a very mechanistic way required the participation of a lot of corporate entities. Some of the less well-known ones are Hugo Boss, uh, who made Nazi uniforms and was a Nazi during his lifetime and Bayer Aspirin, which today is an, it's a subsidiary and an offshoot, kind of a distant offshoot, but it is an offshoot of IG Farben, which is the company that created the Zyklon B, which was the gas that was used in the gas chambers to kill the Jews and other political prisoners uh, and deportees in World War II. Now, after Nuremberg, at the end of the war, there were something called the post-Nuremberg trials, where a number of board of directors of corporations were held accountable. IG Park, Parbin, and Frick, a number of board of directors were in prison for about eight to 10 years, but that was it. And afterwards, they went on to serve major either governmental or corporate roles in post-war Europe. Not much happened for many years after. Why is it important, then, to look at these issues of market actors? Shouldn't we be looking at individual perpetrators, failing states, war groups, and so on? Desmond Tutu says that unaddressed market issues are actually powder kegs that can erupt into future violence. And a number of transitional scholars agree that sustainable peace requires greater in inquiry into these businesses, international and domestic. And the power of these corporations is only growing. This is a Walmart supercenter in China, and Walmart's revenue has now exceeded the GDP of Peru. And this is increasingly the case. A number of multinationals are much larger than the countries in which they're operating. And my argument is that if the field of conflict resolution or post-conflict work or development even does not include market actors to a greater degree, it's going to marginalize itself, not the role of the market actors, which will continue to increase. 
but if it is so important, why is it marginalized? Well, the research that I did showed that, firstly, it seems to have a lot to do with legal lacuna, which means loopholes in the law. The ICC, the International Criminal Court, the Hague, tries international criminals, which means individuals that are perpetrators, not legal entities such as corporations. A number of human rights activists and, and legal professionals have tried to use something called the Alien Tort Statute, that's from 1789 that came out of the United States, to hold some subsidiaries accountable. They were able to do so in the Burma versus Unical case, but failed to do so in Kiobel. And in that Royal Dutch Shell case, the Supreme Court ruled that no, the U.S. Alien Tort Statute could not be used to hold U.S. subsidiaries accountable for international crimes abroad or human rights abuses. Now, in some cases, local countries do have verdicts, like Ecuador held Chevron accountable for some um, damage in their country, but were unable to make Chevron actually pay. So sometimes, even if they can have trials, they don't quite have the leverage over the, over the companies. Then there's other issues. Then one after there's been a lot of violent conflict, sometimes people just want there to be peace and don't want to upset the power elite who have agreed to this peace. And sometimes this power elite is still very involved in corruption or had roles in in the, in the violence, and they don't want to be questioned about that. And sometimes these multinationals are the last stable thing standing in conflict zones, so people do not want to upset that. And then there's a lot of masking of culpability after, after um, conflict. So the central argument of my dissertation was that we really need to include market actors when we're talking about post-conflict work, not just as potential perpetrators, but also in ways that they can actually contribute to the rebuilding of society. It is in their best interest that they have a function, that are operating in a functioning country. The second is emergent from my own research, which has to do with the French National Railroads, which we'll get to, which is that any post-conflict work, regardless of whether it's with market actors or not, really needs to be carried out with a spirit of open-endedness. Any process, whether it's a trial, reparations, victim service, commemorative activity, that's that's intended to close the past, put an end on it and move forward, is very repressive and is usually either upended by people or it tends to contribute to a recurrence of violence because it, it creates that rep repressive state. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So the conflict I studied, I studied what I consider a contemporary conflict but about a decades old crime. In France, during World War II, the country was occupied by the Nazis. They signed an armistice, uh, which allowed the Germans to requisition a lot of the French uh, operations, including the French National Railroad, which is called the SNCF. This was a conglomerate of railroads that unified as one. This company had uh, transported chickens and passengers as well as German soldiers and munitions during the war. The company had about 400,000 employees and it really was, and still is today, the veins through which almost every good in, in person flew through in France. So this company was, had a very major role for during the, um, during the Holocaust and during the German occupation. One of the tasks that the Germans required the SNCF to do was to transport deportees, about 75,000, from France to the German border, where they were then taken by a German train driver to Auschwitz. Of those 75,000, about 2,000 survived. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about why this is a contemporary conflict. So while the SNCF, this train company, had a role in transporting these deportees, there have been a number of people, a small but powerful group of survivors who, and their lawyers and supporters who feel the company has not done enough to make amends. The company has gone on since the war to remain very powerful and very successful. Its international division continues to grow and it bids for contracts throughout the United States as well as Israel. In the United States, it bids in Virginia and Maryland and Florida and California for both regional and high-speed contracts. One survivor, whose name is Leo Brethholtz, made a public statement about why he felt that the company should not be allowed to operate in the United States. And I just want to read a brief part of Leo's words to let you know kind of his perspective on why this is a conflict today. Leo said in March 2014, while it was many years ago, the horrific injustices I experienced during the Holocaust are seared in my brain. I can still recall in explicit detail the atrocities I saw as I was being placed on a cattle car bound for a Nazi death camp and as I watched families being separated and their possessions taken away. And I cannot forget who was responsible. The train company that tried to send me to Auschwitz was owned and operated by the SNCF, a French company that exists today. Leo believes the SNCF collaborated willingly with the Nazis and was paid per head per kilometer to transport these victims. 
Cleo goes on. It's been more than 70 years since the war, and only now is the French government negotiating with the U.S. to provide compensation for me and other victims of the deportation. Leo said, of the 1,000 people on my train, only five survived the war. I was one of the lucky ones. I jumped out of the moving train and managed to pry the bars open on the window, just enough to slip through. Leo died just several days before he was about to give a Senate testimony in Maryland. But he was a very strong activist uh, in wanting the, the company to make some kind of amends, financial amends, make an apology, and be more transparent about what it had done during the past. I was very moved by this uh, by this testimony. In this image here, you actually can see Leo, the picture of Leo in the Toulonsi uh, internment camp in Paris before he was taken. But why trains? Leo Brethholtz was a survivor that escaped the French police, the Gestapo, and many others. He escaped almost seven times. So why this focus on French trains? Why were Leo and his supporters able to galvanize people to create legislation in these states, United, throughout the United States, to almost block the SNCF? The class action lawsuit that they held was unable to move forward for some legal reasons, but they were a very powerful force. But why this focus on French trains? France wasn't the country that started World War II. So I spent a good deal of time thinking about this, the power of this conflict. Well, we know now that there were about 50,000 death and work camps during the war. This was recently released by the work by the Holocaust Museum. Six million Jews and other deportees were killed in those camps, and almost all of them arrived by railroad. It is the one shared experience of all people. While they all went to different camps and did different things at different camps, the railroad was, was what unified people. Raoul Hilberg, who's the father, uh, father of Holocaust research, or considered the father of Holocaust research, said that while many, many corporations colluded in ways during the Holocaust, it was the railroads that were indispensable at its core. It could not have happened without the participation of the railroad. To give you a sense of the amount of railroads, Raoul Hilberg pointed out that there were 42 parallel tracks at Auschwitz alone. 42 parallel tracks. Beyond this, the, rail the railway cars also were symbolically the end. And they really symbolize the ways in which the Nazis dehumanized the Jews before they were killed. They were crammed into cattle cars where they were given no light, no food, no water. And this is what upset so many of the people regarding the French National Railroad, is the way in which the people traveled. They were just crammed in there. If people died, they stayed standing because there was no room. And many can talk about that journey. We have testimony, people talking about what that was like. And I met a number of these people. We never heard what people experienced in the gas chambers. Every one of those gas chambers died but not so in the trains. So we have a sense of maybe what those last moments were like for people, and it's very haunting. And then a lot of memoirs written today and movies about the Holocaust also talk about the trains. They're, they're a very powerful symbol. Train in winter, the last train, the last train to Auschwitz, railways in the Holocaust. This last image is one of the Holocaust Museum that just opened in Johannesburg. They interviewed a number of survivors living in the country, and they all said that to them, railroads were symbolically the most important. In the background there, you can see these railways headed up to the sky. This was just installed recently in a commuter railway uh, station outside in Hungary. And it again commemorates a site where a number of deportees were taken. But why French trains? Again, it wasn't France that started World War II. And in fact, they were only a begrudging uh, collaborator in the war in many ways. So why are we not focused on German trains? For two re main reasons I found, but one had to do with the fact that the SNCF did not change its name after the war. The Deutsche Bahn, the German train company, changed its name. It became the Deutsche Bahn. It made a separate legal entity, and it moved forward. Even on the Deutsche Bahn site today, it says that it's a different separate legal entity. So that's one that makes SNCF legally vulnerable. A second is the SNCF rail cars. They had as many rail cars as they had employees. They had about 400,000 at the start of the war. And once the Nazis got them to other countries, they would use them around to collect other deportees. So if you go to the Holocaust Museum or other see other Holocaust images, you may see deportees getting into or out of SNCF trains in Romania, Romania Lithuania, Hungary. And I, if you see that arrow right there, it points to the SNCF's name. So the branding is just very strong. 
So this led to a lot of questions for me about uh, Leo's testimony and what I learned while I was living in France. I really got curious about what did this company actually do? Did it have any margin of maneuver? Did it collaborate willingly, as Leo said? Did it charge per head per kilometer? Was it making money off of this? Did people know where the deportees were going? So my dissertation looks at all those questions and whether or not they resisted, the railway workers resist. Was there any attempt to help these people? Beyond this, it goes back to what I said at the beginning. I want to look at how market actors are, are dealt with in post-conflict contexts. I wanted to contribute to this SNCF conflict by really contributing a much broader historical foundation for discussions and illuminating some of the victim needs that have been transcending national and temporal boundaries. I'm only going to be able to briefly tell you the research approach and then for the findings you'll probably have to go to the dissertation or contact me which I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, my approach was to embed myself as deeply as I could in as many conversations about this conflict as possible. Uh, this was especially difficult because, as one of the deportees pointed out very well, um, he said, you are well aware, Sarah, I'm sure, that the subject is très délicat, very delicate, that SNCF, c'est la France, meaning the SNCF is France. You might see the SNCF logo as much in France today as you do the French flag. So to attack the SNCF or to question its role during the war is almost like attacking France. And the SNCF was, during the war, a government-owned and operated enterprise by 51 it was 51% government ownership. So it was very aligned with the state. And you can see in this image that the SNCF's logo looks very much like the French flag. Then I went to, in addition, um, to find out the past and really dive into the history to contribute to the historical findings, I spent time in the French archives, American archives, I did a lot of participant observation, meaning I went to the sites from which people were taken, I went to commemorative events, and so on. And I did 120 interviews talk a little bit about those. But for the archives, I went to the SNCF archives, the French National Archives, the French Railway Archives, and in the United States, the Library of Congress and the Holocaust Museum. Participant observation, as I said, I went to a number of sites. I worked a little pro bono with the House of Representatives on this conflict. I attended this, the hearings in Maryland. I went to a French railroad conference where I met the CEO of the SNCF today. I went to the Congress where they were having a Holocaust commemoration day and spent an hour of time with survivors. Uh, I took some people to the reading of the names in France where they read the names of the people who were taken. Uh, I went to the, where the deportees were held in France in a town called Trancy, which is just outside of Paris, the Holocaust Museum, of course, and then I attended the settlement signing. I don't know if you uh, remember, Leo had said that only now the French and the U.S. had begun negotiating over this. Well, they did actually, after Leo passed away, uh, sign a $60 million settlement that is now going into effect to help some people around the world that were not covered by other compensation programs. But it was the interviews that were really the heart and soul of this work. Uh, I met with survivors throughout France and the U.S., SNCS, SNCF executives. This is a picture of Serge Klarsfeld, who is uh, the leading Holocaust activist in France, who just won the highest Medal of Honor in France and Germany for his Holocaust activism. I had the French Jewish leadership. I met with them. American Jewish leadership. I met with them as well. Survivors both for and against holding the SNCF accountable. Uh, the law firms that were working on this conflict. And, and just for those academics out there, uh, historically, Holocaust research has, Holocaust studies has not really welcomed testimony as a valid source of data because survivors, they say, forget things. Uh, they get the, the facts out of, out of order, which they very well might, especially now since most of the survivors that are alive today were children during the war. Uh, and there's been a lot of education about the Holocaust since then. And so some of the past stories are kind of mixed with things people have learned. But I wasn't trying to create this definitive history. I wanted to hear what people had to say, how they saw the train company, what they feel about it now. And Laura Nelson, who's a, um, sorry, Hilda Nelson, who is a narrative scholar, talks about how stories do moral work. So I really wanted to collect people's stories and let those stories do the work they had to do. And I did so by really letting them breathe. Once I took these interviews, just for the academics out there, I did a large thematic analysis to really see some themes that were showing up. And I wish I could share all those findings with you today. It's hard not to. Um, 
then a brief word about who I am, like who am I to study this? And it's very important to look at who actually is doing that. And I just want to tell briefly my story. I was working in advertising in Manhattan. I uh, had no interest in this topic particularly. My job uh, sent me to France because the company had just bought a French division, a French advertising company. So they sent me over. And on my way out, my undergraduate advisor said to me, hey, when you get to France, find out if those French train drivers kept their jobs <laughs> after the war. And that question, I kind of laughed and shrugged. But now that question really led me somewhere very, very powerful. I didn't think about it for about three years, but as I spent time traveling around France and Europe, I started to see the impact of World War I and World War II in ways I never understood living in America. I went to the trenches of Verdun, I went to Berlin, I went to Checkpoint Charlie. I went to my coworker in Poland, brought me to Treblinka, a death camp. And this is an image of that death camp. We went in March, so the picture of snow is, is appropriate. And we crunched through the snow as he told me the story of what had happened there. And all that's left is kind of a rail track, kind of, of, of where people were brought in. And once I got back to Paris after that, something in me shifted. You know, not around that same time, I saw my own name on the Holocaust Memorial Wall in Paris. And I just felt like it could never happen again to anyone. So I found a master's program in Paris and started studying in the evenings uh, and began to study this French to the role of the French National Railroad, not knowing that there was a conflict in the US over that. So that really led me down uh, this long rabbit hole where I am today. And I really started in the beginning wanting to resolve the conflict, wanting to understand what happened and fix it and understand it and make it all work out for everybody. Uh, so I started off in France, livid with what the French co the railroad company had done. I was very angry with the SNCF, heartbroken actually to know that that company would have played a role in taking me and my family and that the country would have. Uh, then I learned what the SNCF had done to make amends and I was surprised. And then I started to think that the US pers uh, perspective of people holding the company accountable was far too strong. But then I started to see that they were really making a contribution as well that led to this $60 million settlement that's covering some survivors. So this led, this combined with what I learned from my interviews, really led me to understand that it's not about resolution, but about open-endedness, being in the conversation, having conversations, not getting stuck in a narrative and static environment where we just treat the SNCF as an extension of the Nazis and then have the victims and the American lawyers coming in as heroes, but really enriching that debate. So that's what I wanted to do through this work. So I won't be able to do this with you now, but the findings go through the historical inquiry. What did the SNCF actually do or not do according to the accusations? And then I look at the, the whole conflict from 1950 all the way to today, and it's still ongoing. Another class action lawsuit was just submitted in Chicago in uh, 2015. But I looked at all the lawsuits. I looked at all the questions of compensation, both in France and regarding the SNCF, truth-seeking efforts within the SNCF and France and worldwide as well, commemoration, commemorative efforts by the SNCF and their apologies and responses to those apologies. I looked at the story that the SNCF and the French government told about itself after the war, which was a real heroic story for which the SNCF received a Medal of Honor for its acts of heroism and the resistance, where it but really neglected to talk about what happened to the deportees. And then I really spent time listening to how people responded to these efforts, how what survivors think about it, both throughout the United States and France. And I won't be able to tell you the breadth of that, but just to give you a couple quotes, um, one French survivor said that he didn't think that we could hold the SNCF accountable that the SNCF workers were working under constraint like he was when he was at Auschwitz. He had traveled on the train with his brother when he was a child. Um, but once the settlement was signed, he actually was glad the company had done it. So there's this, there is a mix, there's a mixed feeling here. The US survivors, um, their, their response was a little different. While there were a number of people like Leo Brethoz who, who felt that the company had to make amends, many who lived abroad in the United States after the war felt that this was just too old, this conflict, that we shouldn't punish the taxpayers of France today, shouldn't punish the kids for what their parents had done. They believed the perpetrators were dead. The survivor said, this kind of thing strikes me as a stretch. It's like trying to strike back at someone now that the real villains are dead. But I found that the, the French survivors who weren't interested in attacking the company had much different reasoning than the American survivors. They had uh, comments that had to do with the complexities. The complexities of everybody was uh, selling people during that time, they would say. Everybody was collaborating or not in some way. They, they talked about how difficult it was, which is, it reflects a real the difficulty of their, I think, having to kind of reassimilate after the war. 
can go into that more. But that's just a little overview. Thank you for listening if you made it this long into the video. And if you have any questions, please do email me at fetterman.sarah at gmail.com.